Each week at St. Paul's, we do three things for our Sunday worship. We do a 9 a.m. Zoom service. We do a 10 a.m. in-person service, which you can also observe on Zoom. And we send out a video. This is the video for October 16th, 2022. We have our fall fling coming up October 22nd. We hope you can make it. Our prayer of the day. Let us pray. God of deliverance, you saved the people of Israel and chose Joshua to lead them to the promised land. Choose us and equip us to live with faith and peace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Joshua, the 24th chapter. Following Moses, Joshua leads the people and renews the covenant with God. <clears throat> then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt with what I did in its midst, midst, and afterwards I brought you out. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and made the sea come upon them and cover them and your eyes saw what I did to Egypt. Afterwards you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you, and I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land, and I destroyed them before you. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove, you out, which drove out before you the two kings of the Amorites. It was not by the sword or by the bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored, and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. You eat the fruit of the vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now therefore revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods of your ancestors served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the land who in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. The people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors <coughs> excuse me, up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did great signs in our sights. He protected us along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites, who lived in the land. Therefore, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, No, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. He said, Then put away the foreign gods that you are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God will we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak in the sanctuary of the Lord. Holy wisdom, holy word, thanks be to God. So Joshua is not uh, one of my favorite books, and <laughs> it's got some good things in it, but it certainly has a lot of war and a lot of destruction and a lot of enemies being vanquished who seem to deserve it. 
Um, so that's very troubling all the time. And uh, it's often put in, in God's hands that God wants enemies to be destroyed utterly and totally. Um, so that's very disturbing. So we try to see if there is something we can uh, take from this book. And there is this idea of being faithful to one God um, and not kind of going between one God and another God. And so there is a lesson there for us about uh, a clarity of what we believe um, and what we are faithful to. And that's very important. Uh, just to say that this week uh, we had a crazy week here at the church. Um, last week, uh, our boiler repair um, did not last a day. And we decided that we needed to find a new boiler repair company. And thankfully, Werner Tijin recommended someone who specializes in just the boiler that we have, the brand new boilers that we have, the high efficiency boilers that we have. Um, so he came. And within about a minute, he told us that there was a dangerous situation with our gas, that the gas pressure coming into the building was twice what it should have been. So there's a regulator that's supposed to regulate the amount of pressure that the gas is pushing into the building. Um, so he had to have the gas turned off. Uh, so we called Con Edison. Con Edison confirmed what he was reading on the pressure and they turned off the gas. Um, that of course is a difficult situation because we have our child care center here so Thursday and today, Friday, we had to have the child care center closed until we can get uh, the situation uh, repaired. So that was kind of a, a cascade of events. Uh, the boiler repair man said, you need to call Con Ed. Con Ed said we needed to call a plumber who was gonna fix the problem with the regulator and the vent for the regulator. Um, the plumber said, you need to go to Village Hall and get a permit, and you need to have someone dig up uh, this uh, plot in the planter because you need to dig out the vent. Um, so there was just one thing after another, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to go here, we need to go there. Um, but it was wonderful that so many people were so quick. Um, the plumber responded very quickly, Con Edison responded very quickly. Um, and then, you know, it took time, but today we got the, the the boiler back on about uh, three o'clock, about two o'clock, um, so that we're ready to have children in the building on Monday morning. Uh, we do still have to do repairs to the boiler because um, there's some problems with the boiler um, valves and so forth. Apparently the pressure of the gas coming into the building uh, caused some damage to the boiler that we have to repair. But we're hoping that that'll be repaired uh, very early next week, probably on Monday. And hopefully it won't be too cold Monday. It'll be just the way it is now, maybe. And as we get into the next week, it will get cold and we will need the heat. Um, so we're glad that we're getting this done just as we are. While the plumber was here um, fixing the vent on the regulator, um, he was asked if he could look in the bathroom at a small problem that we had because we were waiting around for the new regulator to come and there wasn't anything to do but wait for that. So we asked if he could look at something in the bathroom. Um, and he went to the wrong bathroom, not the bathroom we were talking about. Um, when he got to that, that, that bathroom, uh, he saw that there was water flooding into the bathroom, um, that there was gushing water like a, out of a fire hydrant or something. So he went to the wrong bathroom uh, because it wasn't the bathroom we told him to go to, but it was the right bathroom because he saw a problem that if he didn't see it, we would have seen it and we would have called him and called him to come in. And there probably would have been a lot more water damage uh, if he hadn't actually been in the building. Um, so it took some time to identify where the water was coming from to stop it. Um, but luckily he was here uh, to do that uh, within a few minutes. Um, so there's a way in which, you know, when something happens like that, you know, just randomly this water problem happens while there happens to be a plumber in the building, while the children are not in the building when they normally would be. Um, and you kind of say, you know, wasn't that fortunate? Wasn't that coincidental? Wasn't that a miracle um, that he was here just at the right time when we would have needed a plumber and was here, you know, on site so that a lot more damage was averted. So some people say something like, well, you must have had an angel with you or God must have been watching over you. Um, that that random occurrence of a, board, of a flood like that because of um, uh, another water heater uh, having problems uh, happened exactly when it did. Because if that had happened at 6 p.m., uh, you know, overnight, all night long, water would have been flooding into the child care center and the entire child care center would have been uh, filled with water and a lot of damage. 
and people would have shown up expecting their children to go um, to to school and find out that the center was closed uh, just at the just at that moment. So you might say it was very fortunate. You might say it was miraculous. You might say an angel sent him to be there at that time. Um, so I think there's different ways of understanding a coincidence, different ways of understanding a miracle, and they're valid. They're valid different ways uh, of thinking about this. One concern I have is that when people say, you know, I, you know, was going to be in this car, and if I was in that car, I would have been an accident, and so an angel prevented me from doing that. Um, you know, you feel that gratitude, and you understand how close you come sometimes to something happening just by a random occurrence of going left or going right, um, going to work or, you know, missing your train or whatever you hear these stories, right? So I caution you, though, that, you know, not to think, well, God saved me from this accident because I didn't get on the bus or I didn't go here or there. Um, but what about, you know, if you did get on the bus, would we then say that God wanted you to be on the bus to get hurt? Um, you know, the World Trade Center, there were people who were an hour late getting to work who said, you know, an angel kept me out of that building. I didn't get into the building. Um, but what about the thousands of people that were there? Do we think that God wasn't looking out for them? Do they not have guardian angels? So we might have this feeling of gratitude and thankfulness uh, when something, uh, you know, really um, randomly or, um, you know, spectacularly uh, goes right. Um, so that's one way in which we might express it. God was looking out for me and angel was looking out for me. Um, but there are theological implications to that that we should think of. It might be an expression of gratitude, um, an expression of surprise. Um, but what is the theology that we're building there? That's important to think about that. So there's multiple ways in which you could think about it. Another way is to think not that an angel sent the plumber to be with us at the time that we needed him. Um, another way to think of that is that the plumber was an angel. Uh, we were talking one time at Bible study, I think it was Galen who said um, that she thinks we are angels. And that's a beautiful idea. Um, to think that we go and we do things and we're there for people um, that it's not some invisible angel that we can't see who's doing something you know invisible uh directing us but that we in the things that we do we can be there for people in need um we you know people can be there for us when we're in need that we are the angels i think that's another way of using that language um and if you want to take religion out of it all together just to say that you know the first reaction we had to this flood was we have this boiler that's not working and we don't have hot water and there's a problem with the gas and we have to get a permit. You know, it was like things were building on top of build, things on building on top of each other. And then a water heater breaks just randomly on, on top of all that, that it felt like, you know, there's a plague upon us. You know, how many things are going to happen to us? But just shifting our perspective for a minute, saying if that plumber had not been here, things would have been much worse. If that had happened after hours, you know, on a Friday evening, it would have gone all Friday evening, all Saturday, uh, just water everywhere, just logging into everything and not discovered until we were, you know, showing up to come uh, to the building. It could have been so much worse. So your perspective can be simply, you know, that bad things happen. Um, but maybe, you know, we're prepared for them or maybe we're not prepared for them, but things are aligning that it works out uh, well. We can be thankful for that, right? So there's a perspective where we can step back and say this bad thing happened, but let's look for the way in which somebody was there to help us. We were there in time to be of help to somebody else. Um, you know, something had been moved so that that wasn't damaged, something had been brought in so that that would be protected. Um, there's ways in which, you know, a calamity happens where we can say, well, thank goodness it happened when it did. Thank good goodness it happened after this had happened uh, or before that had happened. Just kind of a framing of how we have, how we view things so that we don't say to ourselves, well, we don't want anything bad to happen. Um, in life, we really have to be prepared for bad things to happen. We can't, you know, when bad things happen, we think to ourselves, why? And that's a natural reaction. Um, but at some point we need to be able to step back and say, well, bad things happen. And this is the bad thing that happened today, or this is the bad thing that happened this month. Um, and even if it's the worst thing to think that this is the worst thing that I was, you know, that was bound to happen. It was going to be one thing or another. 
but while we recognize that bad things do happen to say well how could i be prepared um, knowing that bad things are going to happen how can i prepare myself mentally spiritually emotionally physically um, to be prepared uh, like a good uh, scout would be prepared so to frame that uh, in our minds bad things will happen when we have something bad happens to be able to step back and to think about um, how it could have been different or how we tried to make sure we were prepared um, either ready for it or you know prepared emotionally to experience something um, that framing I think is very important so uh, if you watch uh, the rest of this video you will see last week's service I have a video for last week's service so you can watch and see what happened um, after that, there's a video from last weekend. We had an Indigenous Peoples Days event, Indigenous People Peoples Day event, um, and that was kind of unplanned. It kind of came together within a few days. Um, that the event had been planned, but it wasn't going to be here, and they needed a place. And we said we'd be happy to have you here. So I have a video of that. Um, I asked them if I could make a video, thinking a lot of you wouldn't be able to make it, but you didn't have notice and I could show you the video afterwards. So after the video of last Sunday's worship is a video of last weekend's Indigenous Peoples Day event, um, the first one that we've had in Port Jester. And I hope you enjoy that all. And you might leave a reaction uh, on the bottom here, um, or you might leave a comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good morning. If you're able to stand with me. So this morning, instead of having a cross for our procession, we have a light. Um, so we're very glad that we have uh, something that's not quite as heavy as a cross or something like that, something a little bit easier to carry. So this light represents Jesus. 
uh, Jesus the light of the world. And so we turn and we face uh, the candle as it moves into the sanctuary as a way of welcoming Jesus, inviting Jesus into our presence. We're going to begin on page four with our brief order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in mercy has given his son to die for us, and for his sake he gives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. Amen. <laughs> grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of the commandments, 
You give the Israelites laws so that they might live in harmony with one another. Show us how to live in peace so that all may know of your love. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. So the only sign language I know is peace be with you. So I'm trying to do sign language for get the acolyte of bulletin. And I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it is chilly in here. And you know, I told you last week that the boiler was being repaired and they repaired the boiler. And then we had a different problem with the boiler. So it's great, the computer age, everything is so complicated that there's a million things that can go wrong. So I apologize for how chilly it is in here. Um, and hopefully we'll get the boiler repaired and it will stay repaired this time. Uh, just a reminder that we have our fall fling coming up. You see that on page three, uh, set for October 21st, uh, 22nd, Saturday, October 22nd. So that's coming up soon. If it rains on that day, we will move it uh, to the following Saturday. Um, so for this year's fall fling, we're gonna have paint, pumpkin painting and we're gonna have uh, games and prizes and we're gonna have food trucks. Um, in the past, we've uh, prepared food, but this year we thought we'd try a, a little modification. We're gonna have some food trucks. We're gonna have a truck selling tacos and a truck selling ice cream, and another truck doing uh, burgers and chicken sandwiches and stuff. Um, so I hope you all can make it. And um, I know Lori's helping out, and some of you are gonna be helping out um, to set up and to clean up and stuff like that. But hopefully it'll be good weather, and it'll be a lot of fun. And we haven't had a fall fling in three years. And this may be a little bit different than past fall flings, um, just some, modifications as we uh, try to start it again. But uh, we're thankful for all the help and we hope you can be there. We continue on page five with the reading of the gospel for today, the fifth chapter of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Do not think that I have come to abolish the Lord and prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. A reading from the book of Exodus from the 19th and 20th chapters. Now freed from slavery, God gives the Hebrews laws to ensure everyone's freedom is protected. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain saying, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. 
Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Ellie. Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Norma. Russell, thank you for hosting our Zoom again this morning. You guys are nice and warm at home and our teeth are chattering here. I hope you all have heat. Um, you know, sometimes when uh, somebody reads something or, or sings something, we applaud for them. And I know some people think, oh, we shouldn't applaud in church, but I think it's nice when we kind of give a nice reaction to them. Um, we've never applauded a lector, but we have some wonderful lectors who do a beautiful job. So I just want to say that. We have a wonderful variety of lectors um, who are each a little bit different, but they're all wonderful. So we make a point of using the last Sunday of October to mark and to commemorate the beginning of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. I thought this year I would expand it to all the Sundays of October and just talk a little bit about the Reformation over these Sundays. So last week I spoke about Martin Luther. Luther was Luther, and now I'm talking about the 16th century reformer, because he was made for his times. There was this amazing information technology revolution that happened in the 16th century. And Luther was just the perfect person to figure out what message to send out with this amazing tool he had the printing press, to publish and to put out information. So he was who he was because of the time he lived in. He was just the right person with the right message to send to people about how they should all know more about their faith. None of you remember the day before cell phones or the internet or personal computers. I remember that because I'm very old. You all take it for granted that you sit in front of a widescreen TV with a computer on your lap and a cell phone in your hand while you're telling your smart speaker to order something on Uber Eats. <laughs> so I remember when it wasn't that way. In the 1970s, I often think about if we had this pandemic in the 1970s, nobody could be doing remote work, nobody could be doing remote school, nobody could order their groceries, we would have all just had to go on or we would have had to figure out some way to be in desperate situation. So I remember the 1970s, and I have to define for you what I mean when I say the 1970s, because you don't know what that means. 1970s was a 10 year period in the last millennium. And I don't know exactly how to describe it to people today. We didn't have screens everywhere. We looked at each other and we talked to each other. And sometimes I think about, you know, I had nothing to look at, nothing to read if I had a book or something, but you know, how many books could you have? So I can remember staring at walls. <laughs> there were no screens around, right? I can remember looking at wallpaper and thinking, look at that design on the wallpaper. Is that a little bird in the wallpaper there? You could just spend, you know, moments just with your own thoughts, just kind of off in the distance thinking about things. I can remember lying in bed, looking at the ceiling and looking, there's a water stain there. Has that gotten bigger than the last time I saw it? You just have to be with your own thoughts by, by yourself, 
be with each other. We'd read cereal boxes and cereal boxes didn't have, you know, how many grams or what percentage of this or that. They had stories or games. The cereal box would tell you what you could get if you collected enough cereal boxes. That's what we did. So last week we talked about Martin Luther. It was an amazing technology revolution. Information technology exploded in this powerful, powerful way. And he was ready with a message for people who wanted to understand their faith, who wanted to be liberated by their faith. Last week, I talked about how Martin Luther was an earnest young monk who was devoted to the church, but came to be shocked and saddened by the corruption and the greed and above all, by the cynicism and the exploitation he saw in the church. Luther would address this problem in a powerful way by centering people's spirituality, not on a human authority, but on scripture and specifically on scripture, reading it in a way that focused us on how we could trust God, trust God's love and compassion and care and forgiveness. In a word, grace. Last week we read from Exodus about how the Hebrews escaped and how that is meant to help us to see God's liberating power for us, for us individually and for us as a community to be liberated, to know that that's how God acts in the world. Now, continuing with this, let me begin by saying that we are not really Lutherans. I know on the side of the building, it says Lutherans. I know in our article of incorporation, it says Lutherans. I know in our constitution, it says Lutheran. I know on our bulletin, it says Lutherans, right? We were called Lutherans by people who were denouncing us. People were saying, you people are heretics because Luther was declared to be a heretic. Luther was excommunicated from the church. Luther spent years hiding. Otherwise he would have been arrested certainly and probably killed because that's what they did to heretics. Luther managed to hide and then he used the printing press to continue to communicate to people while he was hiding. That was an amazing revolution in his time. So he was able to spread his message and more people began to read and understand. They were not allowed to read his writings. They were not allowed to read the Bible and he was continuing to get his message out. So the church was saying, these people are heretics. This man is a heretic and if you're reading him or listening to him or believing his message, you are a heretic. And they said, you are a Lutheran, meaning you're a heretic meaning you've given up Jesus and now you're following Luther. And in time, people began to say, well, if you wanna say that me believing that Jesus is my Lord and savior and nothing can separate me from his love means I'm a heretic, then I guess I'm a heretic. So people began to take the name Lutheran as a badge of honor, knowing that it meant that they were being denounced as a heretic, but deciding that they believed in the message that Luther was saying about how scripture was meant for us and how scripture could work in our lives. So Lutheran is a misnomer. It's telling us something about us, but it's using the wrong word. But words often change their meaning like that, that we just adopt a word to mean something new. So, but Lutheran is again, a misnomer. People wear it as a badge of honor because they saw a world in which the church was upside down. And they decided that they were heretics in a world where that's what that meant. That they would be outside the orthodoxy if the orthodoxy was against scripture. So they said, if believing this message of the gospel means that I'm a Lutheran, I guess I am. But we do not follow Luther. We do not believe in Luther as that name implies. We follow Jesus. Our faith is in Christ. So we are probably properly described as Christians. So it's important to say this because you need to know that Luther was far from perfect. And we should not hesitate to point out his shortcomings. A few years ago, Chip, our choir director, was reading a book about the Middle Ages called The World Lit Only by Fire. And he came to me the next day and he was like, Pastor, Oh, this book is so horrible because of the things it says about Luther. You wouldn't like it. And I was like, I know all about Luther. 
<laughs> nothing you would tell me about Luther that would shock me because I've heard it. But he was far from perfect. He was anti-Semitic. And he was really the worst kind of anti-Semite because he would tell people to be hateful and to be violent. So we should know that he was not always someone we should listen to. Luther was many things. And we lift up and we remember the contributions that he made, but we also remember that we don't believe in him, we don't follow him. That he lifted up a message that was there in scripture, that was not allowed to be seen by people, that was not translated into a language that they could read until he translated it for them. So what we mean by Lutheran is someone who reads the scripture and understands the scripture message for us. So that's not really a good word for that. Luther said we are evangelicals. And today that word even still means something different. But he meant we believe in the gospel. That's what evangelical means. We believe in the gospel. Luther was a theologian. He thought deeply about Christianity and its teachings. He was a lyricist and composer. We still sing his hymns today. He was a pamphleteer like the leaders of the American Revolution, he would shoot out a pamphlet to start a debate, kind of a provocateur maybe. He would have loved Twitter, like the worst part of Twitter. He would have loved that, to go back and forth with people calling each other names and stuff. That would have been right up his alley. He loved to debate, he loved to joust with people. He was, and he was someone who we might charitably say, used colorful language. It's embarrassing the language that he used. He was though a teacher in the best sense of the term. We still use his small and large catechisms today. He wanted everyone to know the basics of faith. He wanted everyone to feel confident that they could speak of what it meant to be a Christian, that they knew what they meant when they said that they were a Christian. He wanted everyone to be able to, to read and to know basic things about their faith. And most of them couldn't read, so they had to listen. So the catechism would be told to them, they'd re respond to the catechism. So for all of Luther's serious shortcomings, he focused Christians on the way scripture could give us confidence in living a life that walks humbly with God. Confident, not fearful, not shameful. Bold, not cowering. He focused Christians on the way in which scripture could enliven our spirituality, to do everything every day in a way that was grateful and gracious, that we could be forgiven and also forgiving of others. He wanted us to have a complex understanding. He wanted the basics to be understood. He wanted the essentials to be understood, but he also wanted people to know that these things are complex as we're explaining them, as we're coming to understand them. He said that we are saints and sinners, that paradox of who we are, who we understand ourselves to be. He had this understanding of the cross as paradox, the cross of Christ. It killed Jesus. And it is a story that liberates us from fear, from sin, from death, and sends us on a mission of love and healing and purpose and wholeness. Luther focused us on faith. Pulling from the scripture, we are justified by grace through faith. And yet people often misunderstand what he meant by faith. When Luther speaks of faith, he's not talking about belief. And we often use that in that way. It's not about having the right beliefs or the right ideas. It's not about your zeal of how committed you are. It's not about Jesus is my Lord and Savior as a declaration that makes you a person of belief. It's not about saying Jesus is in my heart. That's, that's making a declaration. That's making a decision maybe about what you want to say. That's not what Luther meant. That's not what the scripture means when it talks about faith. Some people think of that. It's my belief. I believe the right thing. I believe and I say the correct thing. That's what people think of when they hear faith, how strongly committed they are to the cause. Faith to Martin Luther, faith to Paul especially, faith in the scripture is not an intellectual ascent. It's not a correct article of faith that you recite. It's not a specific creed. Rather, it is trust. 
When Luther uses that word faith, what he really means is trust, confidence, trust, assurance in God's love and care and commitment. The Old Testament in Hebrew says hesed to talk about God's faithfulness, God's steadfast love. Hesed could, is translated with a dozen different words, but it means God's mercy and faithfulness and commitment, God's steadfast love. It's knowing that, that God is steadfast, knowing and experiencing how God is faithful. So Luther would talk about faith, Gesundheit. Luther would say, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. That's what he means when he says faith. God loves us, he's telling us. God loves us unconditionally. God holds us in love, not because of anything we do to please God. God's grace is unmerited. It is a gift. We receive faith as a gift. gift faith itself is a gift. And it is trust in the one who has given it to us. Luther wrote about faith, it is a living, busy, active, mighty thing. It gives us bravery, it gives us boldness. So Luther was a theologian, he was a raconteur, he was small-minded in many ways, but he was above all practical. Luther, above all else, was a pastor. He wanted his parishioners to hear about God's love without any conditions being placed upon that, without any gatekeepers to stop people. He wanted his parishioners to hear about God's love without being blackmailed about what they must do in order to get it. He wanted his readers, his listeners, those who listened to what was being written to understand God is not angry and resentful. 500 years later, we live in a church. We live as members of this movement that's less focused on being led by priests who perform public rituals and follow scripted formulas. We are instead shaped by a notion of leadership that is shared among all of us together. We have a sense of leadership that is focused on building that community, to have that shared leadership, to carry that work forward. Leadership that organizes us as a common understanding of faith for collective action, living, daring. Our tradition is focused on mutual aid and support, on gathering to be a people of faith, a community of care and service. Luther is flawed. When we call ourselves Lutherans, we should cringe a little bit. I think, well, what I mean by that is not that I'm a Lutheran. What I mean by that is that I have been taken to really believe and trust in God's message that comes through the gospel. Luther was flawed and he did many things that we would cringe at, but he was very honest about the fact that he was flawed. He spoke about people as being flawed and he saw himself as the best example of that. That we are flawed and we are loved by God. Luther was misdirected at times, but he also spoke about a gospel of love that is always meant to be our guide for us to return to, for us to continue to always return to God, a God who is always welcoming us. We always need to reform our faith the way we live out our faith. So we don't just speak about the Reformation as something that happened 500 years ago. We are always reforming, always trying to better understand our faith always returning to God who is ready to welcome us and never leaves us.
We continue on page six with the prayers of the people. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all creation. God, our creator, you called everything into being. Sustain this world with your renewing care. We pray for all victims of hurricanes, storms, wildfires, floods. Help us to meet the needs of others and instill in us a deeper wonder for the created world you called good. May we generously share the abundance of your world. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Holy wisdom, bless all teachers and students. Bless parents who are juggling work and childcare. Help us to nurture young minds with critical thought and young hearts with empathy and curiosity. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Paul. Bless church service programs like schools, hospitals, social service organizations, advocacy groups, universities and nursing homes. Bless scientists and journalists, communicators and artists. May we appreciate the many ways to discern truth. May we each discover how the talents that you have graced us with can be used to your glory. Hear us, O oh God. May we be more than thankful, loving God, for healthcare workers and first responders. May we always support them as they are there to serve us. Bless our veterans and those who have lost loved ones. Remind us of our mission to be your hands for people in need. Hear us, O oh God. God of all nations, we ask your blessing on all who are traveling and vacationing this holiday weekend. Be with us, go before us, show us your love and mercy in every person we meet. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Lord, hear us as we join our prayers together to lift up Angie, Merrick, Karen, Bill, Dennis, Pam, Santa, Max, John, Karen, Julian, Joe, Dan, Erica, Rick, Bill, Jamie, Emmett, Muriel, Kay, Pat, Bob and Suzanne, Russell, Johnny, Pauline, Paul, Michael, John, Elaine, Tessa, Linda, Sandy, Ernesto, Deborah, William, Susie, David, Missy. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Strengthen all newborns, including Callum and Thomas, Bless those recently baptized, including Macy and Amelia and Josie. Bless all who mourn the loss of loved ones, including the family of Daniel Philip Denagris. Bless all who mourn the loss of Robert Salerno and Robert Sullivan. We celebrate with all having birthdays, including Eric and Inga and Tarina, Ruth Ann, Barbara, Alex, Patty, and Don. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Please be seated. So the sign for peace with you. The offering options, of course, are in your bulletin. Uh, can I ask the usher to come forward with the plate? And you can leave your plate, you can leave your offering in the plate as you leave. You can send your offering electronically. You can put your offering in the mail. Uh, but if you want Don to take your offering now, raise your hand, lift up your envelope, and he'll come and he'll take it from you. So I've decided that we're going to skip communion today. Um, I've heard of more of you coming down with COVID in the past month than in the past two years. Um, so I thought it might be a good week to skip communion just to be on the safe side. Um, also, it's very cold in here, so we should cut this short. Um, so just to say uh, that this weekend we had um, an event in here 
uh, Native American uh, celebration. And we didn't know it was gonna be here until Monday. So I didn't even have a chance to tell you about this other than email and uh, texting and whatnot. But there was a Native American group and some local people who wanted to have a celebration of indigenous people. Um, so we had a local historian who talked about the native peoples who lived in this area, the Lanape. Um, there are charts and stuff in the back that I asked her to leave up so that you could see them uh, when you come in today, um, some stories and some pictures. Uh, and we also had uh, a group who called themselves the Aztec Dancers, uh, who came to do a Native American blessing. Um, so we had that here yesterday in the back. Um, and they described a little bit about Aztec culture and spirituality. So it was a beautiful occasion. I videotaped a lot of it. Um, they, I asked them and they said I could videotape it because I knew a lot of you would not even know about it or you knew about it too late um, because it was just uh, decided that it would be here on Monday. It was supposed to be someplace else and they needed to relocate it. And I told them we were happy to have them here. Uh, also yesterday, uh, maybe some of you saw that the Port Chester Fire Department had a uh, unveiling of a new truck that they've recently acquired. Um, you know, those trucks are massive uh, uh, engines and uh, very expensive um, uh, technology. So it's a big deal when they are able to get the money together. And so there was a celebration of one of their new trucks and they asked me uh, to do a blessing on the truck. So I told them I was happy uh, to do that as always. Um, so we always keep in mind our local first responders, especially Port Chester, uh, where they're all volunteers. Um, if you call 911 for a fire in Port Chester, there are volunteers uh, who are coming to your house. So it's important to remember them, to support them in prayer. Um, on page 13 is a form if you wanted to send relief uh, money to people who are affected by Hurricane Ian. Uh, we know there was a lot of death and a lot of destruction. And we work together with other church organizations so that we can respond. Um, on the ground, and not just for a short period of time, but on an extended way. Um, when you put your envelope in the basket, when you send your offering on Venmo, some portion of that goes to the ELCA so that the ELCA can be ready to respond. You can't just send $5, you know, when a, when a flood happens. You have to have an organization in place. So every Sunday, some of your offering goes to the ELCA for administration of these programs that when you give money, that money can go directly and entirely uh, to victims that you want it to go to. So when you say you want your money to go to help people for Hurricane Ian, there's already an infrastructure there that the church has because we keep that um, operating together with other churches and other organizations. So that's there if you wanted that and you can ask for more information about that if you need more information. I wanna thank Philip as always for the beautiful artwork on the cover. Uh, Philip and Martha are serving uh, churches in the Bronx um, that are transitioning between one pastor and another pastor. So we miss Philip and Martha, and we're glad that we're able uh, to send them to churches that uh, don't have pastors currently um, and that they can serve them. And we look forward to, to seeing them back again. But uh, the artwork on the cover uh, is often a reminder of uh, Philip's continued uh, help for us here. So we're going to conclude our service now with the Lord's Prayer. If you're able to stand with me. On page nine. Let us pray together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Just again, want to thank Claudia for doing a wonderful job with the music. Want to thank all of our lectors and all of our Alter Guild members who do such a faithful job. I want to thank Jamie and Ryan for doing a faithful job today. It's wonderful having them up here with me. And uh, also remember on page 11 about growing in faith. Um, we have one person who's uh, taking growing in faith currently, the first course. The second course begins on October 18th. 
And uh, that's going to be on the Old Testament. And that's five Tuesdays. It says six, but you can count. It's five Tuesdays. Um, we're also going to be doing some uh, biblical studies here. Uh, Lori is going to do a series on the book of Esther. Um, but if you wanted to know more about growing in faith, it's on Zoom on Tuesday nights. And you can ask Lori for more information about that. And above that is our blessing. Let us pray. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us in mercy and grant us peace. Amen.
Go in peace, serve your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Um, wanted to put this presentation on as more people become aware and um, familiar with Indigenous culture. Um, we have many people uh, with Indigenous ancestry that lives in Colchester. Certainly, we are on land that has been populated by the Lenape, primarily the Lenape people. Um, and so, it is about time that we pay homage um, and recognize. Um, the original peoples of this land. And if I may introduce Sochil Blanca. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sochil Blanca. I live in, uh, I'm resident in Fort Chester, like 20 years old. In mm -hmm. this place, I love Fort Chester. <laughs> and I love my culture and indigenous people in Mexico. Aztec and Zapotec. Aztec and Zapotec indigenous mm -hmm. people. Welcome to that. Um, I just recently started my ancestry um, journey and found that um, 70, almost 76% of my ancestry is from West Africa, um, particularly the Uwe, Fan, Gagdami, and Fante, Fula, and Wolof peoples. Um, more recently, my family and ancestors came from Haiti and Martinique. I do not know if I have any Taino um, uh, ancestry or DNA. Uh, the Taino were the indigenous people of the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico, all of the Dominican Republic, um, Cuba, and the Bahamas. Um, and so uh, do not claim to have all of the insight into indigenous culture, um, but thought that it was still important to at least start somewhere um, in sharing the indigenous culture that we live amongst and around, and that really uh, were the first peoples of the country. So, so Sheila is going to bless our little um, gathering today with a blessing dance. And so, so Sheila, thank you. You're welcome. What's your name, We're going to be to the population for changing to the modern path, to the uh, higher uh, to for the life. So thank you for the uh for the life in here. Life for the here. So we're happy that we happy that you can
uh, continuamos con nuestras tradiciones que nos han dejado nuestros abuelos de generación a generación. We continue our traditions, our ancestors left for us to continue so they won't go in vain and they won't die. Pueden ver que tenemos algunas fotos de nuestros ancestros que ellos hace muchos años vinieron para acá a esta tierra y han continuado con la danza. Tenemos varias fotos de diferentes So we're honoring them with like what they left us, what they taught us, and we're just continuing this legacy and passing it on to our new generations. Tenemos aquí una figura que para nosotros representa lo que es parte del ser humano, la, los ciclos del ser humano que es nacer, crecer, morir, como la naturaleza. So we have right here one of the pictures of us standing five foot apart. We are born, we live. And we die. We go back to Earth. If you guys want to take a closer look at it. Esto también de este usamos plumas de águilas que son para nosotros simbolizar como un rayo de sol. Nuestros instrumentos están hechos de animales, no los matamos, pero encontramos sus piezas y los inmortalizamos en instrumentos. So, our instruments come from, from different types of animals. We have a sacrifice on an animal, so we feel like a dead animal. But when we're walking or something, we always try to give them like a nice ceremony for them to go to the other flight. And then we, in order to honor them, we keep some of their stuff so we can make instruments and they follow through their numbers. Usamos también en algunas otras comunidades de estos pueblos esta Oh, in some other parts of our community, different parts of like Mexico, a lot of people like to use dream captures just to keep away negative spirits and, and negative like, energy. So we all come from different parts of Mexico. So well, she's from well, Oaxaca, yeah. which I believe is in the south. The Zapotec people, Zapotec Nation. The Zapotec Nation. Um, so if we're going to be in the there too, come from Morelos. I don't know if you guys heard of Emiliano Zapata. Sure. Yeah, that's where they come from. I believe um, they have ancestry fought in the revolution. Um, she comes from the... Um, federal District of Mexico, and my parents are from that So she'll explain to me that at one point, um, that with the invasion, of the, many of the tribes scattered, and at one point, you were all brought back together again through dance and used dance as a way of uniting and, and bringing everything back together again. Yeah, so, um, What I learned was that um, when the invasion started and they started, like the Europeans started conquering Mexico, they would kill any tribe that wouldn't worship their God. So our ancestors had an idea, and some people don't understand right now, like why we still dance in churches, why we still honor like images, like mm -hmm. um, Catholic images. It's because our ancestors, when they were getting murdered, They came up with the idea that in order for them to 
survive, they will play like one of our images inside the other image. So when the European action to kneel down and bow down and pray, they would do it because we knew what was inside. So that's how we survive. And that's why we still keep on doing it today. Thank you so much, you're welcome. of this, I'm going to focus the first part just on talking about indigenous people pre-contact, then I'm going to do some colonization, and I'm going to talk about after colonization. But I would like to point out that um, there are pieces of information spread out around um, over here. There's also a board over there. I've got some stuff over here. I'm going to talk about this in particular. So um, get some food, and then at some point, please take a look at all the stuff that we have around there. Um, so I want to very quickly just go back to the end of the Pleistocene, which I know sounds like it's a very long time ago. Um, but that's when human beings start to spread out around the world. Um, and we are evolving into Homo sapiens today. Um, and you can probably picture some of the animals that would have been around at the end of the Pleistocene. So that would be saber-toothed cats, woolly mammoths, dire wolves. Um, and I wanted to read a quote about what happened to all these animals. Um, so at the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they noted that, quote, for decades, archeologists and paleontologists have debated the causes of their extinction with explanations including overkill, environmental change, hyper disease, and an extraterrestrial impact, um, which just means a meteor, by the way, <laughs> not aliens. <laughs> Um, but I will point out, if you want to think about into our past of Paleo-Americans, you know, scientists considering, were Paleo-Americans actually able to wipe out dire wolves using stone tools? Those are some really formidable people, right? Um, and I want to point out that these Paleo-Americans were up to much more than just hunting. Um, they were also busy domesticating plants. And I do want to point out that um, there is, are some corn plants here. I have a lot of corn information over here. Um, and that's because corn is one of the biggest crops on the planet today. And we owe our ability to eat and heat things <laughs> with corn to indigenous people. Um, so I think if you look at this original grass right here, which is called Teosint, this is what indigenous people would have seen. It's a grass, it's really scrawny, it's got about 12 kernels on it. And through years and years of plant breeding, they were able to turn that into what we know today as corn. Now, I do not think that this looks appetizing and I don't have the vision to turn that into this. Right? Um, so, and I do just have some facts to hear just to point out that now corn is grown in the billions of tons, the billions of tons around the world. Um, most people are familiar with the three sisters, which is corn, beans, and squash. Um, squash in the sense of pumpkins and gourds. Um, and these were cultivated by indigenous people all the way from what is now very southern Peru to the southern part of Canada. Um, and that is a really overwhelming agricultural success. Um, so the three sisters 
Um, in case you're not super familiar with how that works, is uh, squash is planted at the base, um, corn grows in the middle, and the beans grow up the sides of it. So not only is it hugely sustainable, but it's hugely effective. You do not have to fertilize it. You didn't really have to worry about weeding. Um, and it's it really an incredible achievement. Um, so an article recently in Genomic Biology noted that, quote, modern civilization depends on only a few plant species for its nourishment. These crops were derived by several thousands of years of human selection that transformed wild ancestors, like this, into high yielding domesticated descendants. Among cultivated plants, the common bean, which is part of the three sisters, is the most important grain legume in the world. So these early farmers domesticated corn, domesticated squash, domesticated the beans, and they figured out how to grow them all sustainably. So I also want to point out there's this fascinating bit of research from um, Professor Jane Mount Pleasant, who is a Tuscarora researcher who's also a professor at um, Cornell. And um, she's done a lot of research into the nutrition of this. Now, you might think that a diet based on corn, beans, and squash wouldn't be particularly nutritional, but it's actually hugely nutritional. And one of the things that makes it work so well is that the amino acids that are in the um, corn, the beans, and the squash are complementary. And then also that um, indigenous people were able to fix one of the big problems with having a corn-based diet, um, that, which is that it, you have a real lack of niacin in it by using a process called nixtamalization, sorry. <laughs> so nixtamalization is where you soak corn in what they would have used wood ash. Today, we just use um, calcium, or eight, I think, um, but it's that if you can sort of smell that tortilla smell or you can smell the empanadas over there, that is the smell of mixed emulsization. And what it does is it increases the protein quality and quantity of corn, um, as well as increasing the amount of niacin and calcium in it. Um, it prevents the dread disease of pellagra and it allows people to live sustainably on the three sisters with other foods collected from hunting or foraging. Um, and I just wanna say, I think we owe a big thank you <laughs> to these indigenous farmers of the past who figured out an incredible way to farm these things sustainably, um, which is most definitely not appreciated by people when they arrive here from Europe. Just wanted to take a quick sec second. Um, I happen to love flowers um, in particular. These are, um, some wild sunflowers that um, you can see don't have really big seed heads today. Sunflowers are one of the biggest crops around the world. They're grown for sunflower oil, oil everywhere. So um, I think if you look at that and then you try and picture a regular sunflower, you can see how much plant breeding know-how really went into changing that. Um, so for thousands of years, we know that indigenous people here were just living their own lives and doing their own thing and having their own wars. Um, but um, there was a really a gigantic cultural clash, obviously, when Europeans arrived. Now, Europeans did not do a fantastic job of keeping records of the indigenous people because they weren't particularly interested um, in them. So one of the things I'm just gonna mention is that um, it's very hard to pin down an exact people in an exact place at an exact time. So today you might know exactly where the border is between New York and Connecticut, but that's really not the case in the past. Um, but we do know that there were many, many peoples who were here. Um, they included the Lenape, the Mohican, the Mohawk, and the Mohican. And the Munsi are part of the larger Lenape peoples. And there were many different bands of the Munsi, which would include the Raritan, the Wappingers, the Kitch, Kitch, I'm not gonna get this right, Kitchwat Twanks, the Sinsinks, and the Weech Kreisdex. Um, but we know that a lot of trade occurred also with indigenous peoples around here that you might be more familiar with, like the Oneida, the Seneca, the Seneca and the Iroquois. So Paul Otto, who's done a lot of research in the Dutch and the Muncie 
um, in this area, talks about how when um, Giovanni de Verrazzano first arrived in 1524, um, he was really encountering the Muncie people at um, the mouth of New York Bay. Um, and that what you have at the beginning is not a phase of colonization, but really more of a phase of exploration. So you have isolated, um, infrequent contact. Um, and some of those would have included some violence, you know, Henry Hudson's voyage up um, what we now call the Hudson. Um, there was a fight between his crew and the indigenous people, and that resulted in a crew member being shot through the throat with an arrow. Um, but that there was infrequent and not sustained contact. Um, and then you have a period of colonization um, and Europeans begin to arrive really fast and furious. So the Dutch form companies of merchants to establish colonies and they build a fort right off the bat in 1614. Um, and for the purpose of simplicity, I think I'll just state that a general attitude of a lot of these companies could be summed up as maximum extraction. And that's a big conflict. If you think about it between how do I live sustainably with the earth and how do I extract as much as I possibly can from where I am. Um, in 1621, New Netherland is established and in 1626, the Dutch state that they have purchased Manhattan. I have a copy of a letter that mentions that over there if you wanna take a look at it. Um, so it's well known that indigenous people and Europeans had very different ideas about what it meant to purchase land. Um, the Muncie did not recognize personal ownership of land and um, probably would have been more familiar with the system that we might think of as leasing something where you could arrange to use a piece of land for a period of time, but it did not mean that it was yours in perpetuity. Um, Europeans, when they arrived, absolutely wanted to have um, permanent control. And as more European powers start to arrive, like in 1620, the English arrive in what is now Massachusetts, that is an even bigger cultural clash. Um, the indigenous people most likely to have been living right here are probably the Weech Christ Kecks. So these would have been part of the Muncie, who were part of the Lenape. Um, so I'm going to quote to you from an 1872 source. Um, the, this is about the Weech Christ Kecks. Their territory appears to have extended from Norwalk on the Sound to the Hudson and to have embraced considerable portions of the towns of Mount Pleasant, Greenberg, White Plains, and Rye. Their sachem in 1649, that's kind of like saying too, um, that was Ponupau Halbson in 1660, Afna, and there's a whole list of them. And I'm going to come back to why we actually have these names, um, but there's quite a number of them. Um, Paul Ada notes that the Muncie very shortly after the arrival of the Dutch are beginning to have really limited options. Um, there was the option of military resistance to the Europeans, but there are obvious downsides to that, um, not the least of which is the beginning um, technological superiority of the Europeans who arrived. Um, there's the option of trying to accommodate, um, which is a nonviolent path, but in the long run only works if you have a two-way understanding. And lastly, there's leaving the area completely, which is a last resort. Um, different groups in this area had different methods. Um, the Muncie were not a hierarchical group, so different bands could and did make different decisions about what they wanted to do. Um, I want to point out that the effects of European diseases on the Muncie um, were that they very, very quickly began to suffer precipitous population decline. Um, from an estimated high of about 15,000 people in Muncie country in 1607, the population is about 6,000 by 1630. Um, and it would be really hard not to notice a population loss um, like that. That's a very short period of time to lose such an enormous number of people. So we want to understand that indigenous people were facing a lot of different challenges, um, in part because these diseases like smallpox and influenza tend to kill the very young, but also the old, which means that your leadership group of people are being wiped out just as you really need leadership. Um, and so here I'm just going to do a very quick rundown 
of some of the major events right here. So as I already said, the new Amsterdam is established in 1626. Colonists don't just live in New Amsterdam. Um, they spread out around the area in part because they want to trade with Native Americans and in part because they want to avoid taxation by the uh -huh. Dutch. <laughs> Um, so Greenwich, for example, is established in 1639. Um, and this means that you have increased conflict between the colonists and the Muncie all over the place, not just in one area. Um, so here's, I think, a really good example of the kind of conflict we're talking about. Um, so here's a quotation. The Muncie used the land to grow gardens of corn and beans, which formed a major part of their diet. Since the Indian did not sense their fence their fields, however, the crops were vulnerable to European livestock, which foraged freely in the woods and the Indian gardens. To protect their crops, the Indians frequently killed the animals. Okay. So you might think, well, the Europeans could have fenced in their animals. <laughs> but the European perspective was, you should fence in your crops. We're going to let our animals forage around so that you can see the types of cultural clash that they have from there. Um, eventually, the Weech Kreisgacks find themselves hemmed in on all sides by the Europeans and by more powerful Indian groups. Um, and the Dutch Director General of New Netherland, William Keeft, um, attempts to impose a tax on the Muncie um, for no reason. Um, and some of the bands, not all of them, but some of the bands, um, in, including the Weech Kreisgacks, decide to fight back on this. Um, so there are killing of colonists, there are killings of the Muncie, and this um, goes throughout um, 1643. And then in 1644, uh, Captain John Underhill leads 130 soldiers who landed at Greenwich on the mainland and marched to an Indian, Indian fortress there. There he arrayed his troops around the fortified village and ordered them to open fire. When the Indians refused to come out and fight, Underhill directed his men to set the village on fire. Knowing that the Indians would choose a fiery death over slaughter at the hands of his men, Underhill virtually wiped out the entire village. Over 500 Indians were killed and only eight escaped. In contrast, Underhill's troops only suffered a few wounded and one casualty. This and similar conquests accounted for much of the Indian losses in 1643 to 1644, which reached a staggering 1,600 men, women, and children. Recoiling from these losses and needing to plant their crops and begin fishing, representatives from the Weech Kreisgacks and a number of other bands of the Muncie made various peace agreements with Kieft. And although some hostilities continued until 1645, that war was essentially over. So by 1640, the Muncie population is down to about 4,000. By 1664, it's less than 3,000. At this point, the population of New Netherland is well above 9,000. And um, if you remember the names of the Weechkweisgex uh, chief that I mentioned before, we have all of those names because they all ended up on land deeds as um, some indigenous people just tried to make the best of a tough situation and they accepted offers to, you know, quote unquote, sell their land. And by 1720, the Muncie are effectively gone from this area. Um, so where are they today? Um, if you take a look around, I have definitely put some information about um, where they are. Um, they were split up into different groups as they left at different times. Um, the main one is, I'm gonna talk about is the Lenape uh, group, it, which is in Manhattan. And I encourage you to go to their website, which is the lenapecenter.com. There is also branches of what would have been originally one group of people now in Kansas, Ontario, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, uh, Delaware, and New Jersey. So that is a quick Thank you. So what, one thing that I one thing that I've learned is is that the U.S. Constitution was based on um, Iroquois. Yes. So the Iroquois are a larger confederacy, more, more to the north. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
been fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So what I think we want to do now is let's, you know, get up and walk around a little bit. There are displays of, 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 of things, pictures that uh, so Shield has provided us and artwork and, and, and craft um, of indigenous creation. Um, grab something to eat, stroll around, there's some history up against the wall. And then at about uh, at 315, we're going to go outside to do what's called a friendship dance, which was a dance that was to bring all of the, the, the bands and the tribes together at one point. So on the first the track there, I think when all the genocide and all the tribes were to be different parts of the world. The only way to be for all of them to come together. And they decided to make it in a friendship dance because different tribes, even though they were not fighting, but they were not like talking to each other, like you don't talk to your neighbor. Yeah. And if the landlord is bad, everybody has to get together in order to get like some justice, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how the friendship dance happens. Awesome. And then another thing, how can you guys help indigenous groups here in, in New York or different parts? Um, well, we are struggling with ceremony, and it's very difficult for us to find places where we can continue our ceremonies. So, if you guys know, like anyone that led us, like a place, like it could be like a church or something, for our traditional ceremonies, like that's how you guys can help us out. So, we could continue what our ancestors left us. Awesome. And so, All Souls Church, which is on Parkway Drive. Is now no longer a regular um, practice church as a, yeah. as, as a, as a, as a tradition. Yeah. There is a church that does rent it out, like the people who think that we sing it out, but they're, they're considering what to use that space for. And so I'm hoping that you know groups like yours will be able to go there to practice and to meet on a regular basis. Right. So, yeah. 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 Last one. Yep. Uh, after Frank, E R R E R. Okay, and where, where are you from? I was born and raised in the Bronx, but my parents are from Veracruz, Mexico.